around. So you can see that the visitors were also coming by the causeway, the, the line at the bottom, and uh, they were using the original access route. So the causeway that was built for the access for the royal burial and uh, ceremonies, that was still used by the um, visitors several centuries later in the uh, New Kingdom. So we have a sense of a space where we are in the landscape, also the sense of the original architectural concept of the pyramid site. So once again, causeway leading to the South Temple on the south side of the pyramid, pyramid temple on the east side, North Chapel on the north side. And if that seems like I'm repeating what you've already noticed, please keep in mind that there are several shrines surrounding this big thing uh, in the middle. And now let's make sure that things move everywhere. And everybody should now be looking at an example of the type of secondary epigraphy that we are finding. So New Kingdom material. Yeah. Would it be possible for you to increase the size of the window on the screen just so that we can hear the graffiti more closely? Something like that. Thank you. And I hope it's uh, reasonably OK on everybody's screens in the online presentation. What you're looking at is not the most recent find. I'm coming to these very, very shortly. But it is a very good example of a longer type of a hieratic inscription. So for those of you who are not entirely spe spending all the time with Egyptians, uh, the cursive script uh, written uh, in everyday use, forget hieroglyphs, hieratic is your thing if you are an ancient Egyptian scribe. Hieroglyphs are wonderful, but they're monumental things. Not everybody can write them, not everybody can even read them. If you're working as an administrator, as a physician, as a scribe of any description whatsoever in ancient Egypt, this is the cursive script of everyday life, written in black or red ink. They were using rubra. Rubric in classical sources has Egyptian roots. Um, so this is also the script used for visitors' inscriptions in the New Kingdom. Um, and this is an example of a longer text that is reflecting the concerns and political endeavors of the 18th dynasty. So we're moving to the visitors in, let's say, that would be 15th century BC, 1400 something. From the reign of Tutmosis III, one of the important pharaohs of the 18th dynasty, and this text, in fact, reflects the activities and works of this particular king. Many times what you do find across the board in the visitors' inscriptions is people's names, affiliations, and various devotional concerns, about which more later. But these scribes here were leaving also in the pyramid complex of San Moset III and in the times of the 18th dynasty, these longer texts with historical content. So what they were doing was not only saying, I was here, which would have been at the top and it's broken off, but they were also saying, my king is to Moses III and he's really doing fantastic stuff. In this case, building temples for the Goptar in Memphis, which is one of the few references to this particular architectural enterprise, and also the famous wars of Tutmosis III are referenced in the text. Wars in Syria, characteristically. So it's an example of a more specific type of a visitor's inscription that appears variations thereof on several places in Dashur. Uh, and it also gives you an idea about in what state do we find these inscriptions. Because what you see is a large fragment, it's, uh, it's really big, it's sort of a, over a, uh, a meter wide, but it's a still a fragment from a doorway. Uh, doorway is something to remember. Doorways are usually not covered in relief decoration, so they don't show kings and gods and monumental inscriptions. They're usually just pale, yellowish or green or striped. So they're flat, they're pale, and it's practical to write on them, which is a factor when you are leaving secondary epigraphy, where you can write, where on the wall you can reach, and how does your surface behave. On the other hand, it's necessary to say that when you're marking a doorway, it's also a liminal space. You're stepping from one space to the next. You're getting a sense of control of both spaces, and you're also moving through a temple. This fragment is from the South Temple, I believe. So you're also proceeding through the sacred space 
of the temple. So choosing a doorway may be both for ideological reasons and for practical reasons. In any case, it was providing a very nice surface uh, to be read, but nonetheless, it's still a fragment. And this is one of the largest fragments that we have. Most of the fragments are much smaller because the pyramid complex was demolished. And we will get to that uh, briefly. It was demolished still in ancient Egypt. It was demolished in a way that left its magnificent limestone relief decoration in fragments, most of them about this big. So you don't have any walls. We have mud brick sub foundations of all these buildings that you saw on the plan. We have the mud brick core of the pyramid. We don't have the casing that made the pyramid look nice and neat. We have no walls standing except for a couple of larger, larger fragments like this one, but everything else is a mass of broken uh, stone. Which is also a specific challenge when you want to recontextualize uh, secondary epigraphy. And it's vital to recontextualize it because it was produced in a defined space on a standing wall. It's absolutely related to this physical setting, and we don't have that. We have to reconstruct it, we have to uh, imagine it. So, moving forward to reconstructing and imagining, and also moving to October 2021. This is the situation, the ongoing research in the so-called South Temple. So that's why I was harping about where things are in the pyramid complex. So just remember the plan, the big thing south of the pyramid. You can see the strange volcano in the background. That's, of course, the above mentioned mud brick core of the pyramid of St. Mosin III. You can also see just in front the mud brick sub foundation of the South Temple. And on the top of it, there is not so much a foundation or any wall. There is a massive layer of fragments of different size and also a layer of limestone chips, small bits of limestone that have no discernible surface decoration or a graffiti for that matter. That is the proof of demolition. This place was raised to the ground, broken into pieces, and the limestone was reused on a large scale and still in ancient Egypt and in New Kingdom just a couple of generations after the scribes of Tutmosis III were visiting the place and celebrating the king, which is what we saw on the previous uh, slide. So you get a sense of a big change that came already in antiquity and in quite a quick succession. Uh, we would think. And that's also one of the core questions that we're asking now during the research that's ongoing in Dashur in these past couple of years. And we hope to continue with the, uh, the whole team of the Egyptian expedition of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Uh, they run the site. And I was very fortunate to be invited uh, some time ago to work on the secondary epigraphy there. And now what the Metropolitan team is focusing on is not only the pyramid itself, how it was magnificent, how magnificent the temple walls were, but also what the life of the pyramid was like. What is the cultural biography of this particular site? And I dare say that secondary epigraphy has something to tell. And you may want to recall Ian's talk about abiders, that's the life of a temple. Abydos is still standing and it was standing for centuries and marked upon by different stakeholders interested or just passing by. This place was marked across the 18th dynasty and then demolished during, yes, I should tell you, and you probably already guessed, Ramesside period. Ramses II meet the man who invented recycling. Um, Ramses II is probably the pharaoh responsible, or at least people in his service are responsible for what you see in front of you. A Middle Kingdom pyramid complex demolished to mud brick sub foundations and in pieces. So what we find is a sense of a place broken up. Also, the stone was moved around. For example, we get a sense that things were moved from other bits of the pyramid complex, again, hearkening back to the plan, 
and dragged through this area of the South Temple and then through the causeway, which was also being demolished in the process, downhill to the Nile Valley and then taken away for recycling. We have no proof where they went. We have some dockets that could be so essentially hieratic labels, very different inscriptions from the visitors text that you've just seen. These dockets tell you where these pieces were going. They name various temples, but Ramses built a lot of temples of Amun or Ra. So we're not entirely sure. One suspect is the area of Memphis. The other suspect is a major Ramesside center in the eastern delta of the Nile called Pyramese. So we have suspects, we don't have a proof. So you can imagine the very dusty and very noisy uh, demolition process going on on the place uh, that is being uncovered by the Egyptian team and the international team of the yes, Egyptian yeah. expedition, the Metropolitan uh, Museum. And just making sure we're moving all the slides. And that's where we end up. I was talking about fragments and reconstituting the pyramid complex. This is a view of the new storage facility of the mission in Dashur, close by. If you ever uh, look on Google Maps, you will find St. Wasset III. It really looks like a volcano. And then you will find a large gas factory. And then you will see flat buildings close to the gas factory. And one of them is this. The gas factory is a bit of a problematic neighbor, but uh, we got used to it. Um, in any case, this is the new storage facility. Uh, there was a bit about, I hope you can hear me now, also online, we can, we're finding a lot of column fragments, which is rather specific. They, um, what, how do you tell a column fragment apart from any other fragment? They are usually rounded or some part of them is, uh, is rounded and we'll see a little bit more of them uh, coming to it. So column fragments seem to concentrate in the South Temple area suggesting that this is where colonnades were built. And for some interesting reason, the South Temple columns, and there is a column fragment roughly in the middle of that heap of bigger fragments in the, in the uh, well, essentially what is really a heap of limestone, but you should believe me that there is a column fragment there. Um, they were very popular when it came to graffiti writing. The columns were usually over four meters high and up to two meters on the stem, we find the text. We don't have complete columns, but we have enough fragments to be able to reconstruct their appearance, their size, and also which part of the, which part of the column we're looking at when we find uh, a uh, fragment. A detailed view of the site and more importantly, views of the columns. So to illustrate what I'm talking about, this is the colonnade of the South Temple as it looks nowadays, which is characteristically in pieces. Um, it's, a, it's a big, big work in terms of um, architects and archeologists from the mission, putting them all together from an epigraphist perspective, Copying inscriptions from these are not, it's not the easiest bit of work, but it's fascinating because then you really feel like you're very close to the experience of the uh, graffiti uh, writer. This is our uh, column magazine with all the, uh, all the finds, uh, not yet all, that would be a larger photograph, but it gives you an idea of what we're looking at. And again, the column fragments rank among the larger surviving pieces. Uh, from this uh, pyramid complex. And the graffiti, or rather the pinti, shall we say, because they're not scratched, they're painted. And this is on purpose. You can't see anything. And that is, unfortunately, on the screen, maybe you may see a little bit more. But that is, unfortunately, a very good illustration of the status in which many of these texts are found. 
they're pale, they're faded, they were damaged in the past, and we try to protect them and conserve the surface at the moment. We also use various enhancement techniques, digital photography, to get something out of them. However, uh, in fact, a combination of observation on site and digital enhancement is, uh, in this case, quite uh, irreplaceable. The texts on the columns mostly come from the 18th dynasty, and that's reconfirmed. The new finds confirm finds from the previous uh, couple of decades because it's a long term project. And it's all the same story. South Temple was massively visited in the 18th dynasty. People were stating, I was here, I have a devotional interest, I have identified this shrine. Um, if you haven't met this type of inscriptions before, a standard uh, visitors' inscription from the 18th dynasty says there came a scribe X Y Z to see the shrine of a king. In this case, King Haka Ra, that is Senwoset the third under his official coronation or throne name, and found it beautiful, more beautiful than any other temple. And then he, the visitor, said an offering formula for the King Haka Ra. Could the king receive thousands of fowls and thousands of goats and thousands of bread and wine and beer and every, every good and pure thing? So essentially, the person is stating their status, their scribe, their literate, their intellectual, they're stating their name, sometimes they may add their affiliation, they're stating their historical knowledge of the site, and they're also, something to remember, participating in the cult the ritual for the benefit of the pyramid builder, San Mosret the third, because they are saying the offering formula, offering formula being a specific ancient Egyptian text designed to serve the deceased, to provide the deceased with anything they might need for their life in the uh, netherworld. So this is the sort of story that the columns of the South Temple keep telling. 18th dynasty people interested in the site with degree of devotional interest and also historical knowledge. They know where they are, uh, essentially. But there is uh, more to it. Uh, this light is probably, uh, I suppose now the online audience has the advantage. Uh, maybe if we try to turn up the light. Because, yeah, that's, thank you, that's much better now for everybody. Um, the thing that you can see is, well, uh, I, who will guess, what are we looking at? I'm sure some, some of you know. <laughs> Apart from the fact that it looks like a red ink blob. Any attempts? A person. There is a person, definitely. Yeah. Who that might be? Is there only one person or two? Carrying someone? Uh, close. Uh, oh, oh. Very close. Um, <laughs> it's a king killing an enemy. Uh -huh. And the tall thing is the crown. They the sort of the sweeping thing behind the crown is the raised hand with a sword. The other hand is grasping the head of the enemy. Uh, the enemy is the smaller blob in front of the king. And we only know this and are able to, I'm able to tell you this because um, I spotted the red thing, photographed it, <coughs> ran it through digital enhancement and got this result. So that's also giving you an idea about the technology and process being used to record and interpret these texts. So we do get, importantly, a sense that secondary epigraphy does not involve only texts, it certainly involves figures and royal, divine, human and animal figures, predictably, being among the most frequent that appear in this kind of uh, material. And this again refers to royal ideology. This is somebody hinting at quintessential imagery of the Egyptian king as the protector of the realm, disposing of uh, 
bloody foreigner, somebody like me in the UK. Uh, but let's move on to uh, secondary and the other elements. I told you that a lot of it tends to concentrate on columns, but that's not the only place. This is a very preliminary uh, guess at secondary epigraphy locations from the new finds between 2018 and 2019, which is also the years that I was working on when uh, in there in uh, last October. And you can spot that a lot of them are on columns, that's the green. There are others on dados, which is the bottom part of the wall. Also, if you read French, called sous-basman, so essentially the bottom meter or meter and a half uh, of, of a wall. And then we get the um, doorway as well um, as a very significant point. However, there's also a lot of other, that's the largest bit, the red one on the pipe chart, which tells us mostly that we can't say exactly where the fragment is coming from, probably from a decorated wall usually. But nonetheless, if you imagine the coverage, the, the square yardage of uh, relief walls and then the standing columns and the specific places like the bottoms of the walls and the doorways, it's, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting breakdown. And essentially the find pattern also shows you in which years we found more columns than in the other years. It's not to say that the graffiti were written on a column in a certain location in the temple and not in another location. We can't have a statistic evaluation like that because the place in, is in such a, a broken uh, state. Nonetheless, secondary epigraphy locations do matter. Despite all the problems that we have with evaluating the statistics, where these things are written does matter. If they're on a column, people were uh, walking through the colonnade. If they're on the bottom of a wall, they could have been not only standing, but more like sitting or squatting, spending some time on site there, which tells you not only the longer inscription takes time to produce, but people actually sat down to spend time in the uh, pyramid complex. So could we say anything about location choices in a more general sense? Uh, well, in a really general sense, yes, because the surface choice, where do you write or draw, it definitely might have been dictated simply by what was available, whether you could get to a particular part of the wall. But apart from accessibility and expediency, the location might have been also chosen for closeness to something else of interest. And that's uh, where I hope to be able to demonstrate this on a selection from the North Chapel. So if you try to remember again the uh, archaeological plan, that's the small structure on the north side of the pyramid, the smallest of all the shrines that St. Wassen III built to surround his uh, pyramid. Pyramid complex consists of the pyramid and shrines. That's something to remember if you remember nothing else. Hopefully you remember what, what graffiti are and what we can use them for. And the North Chapel is this specific location on the north side. Uh, to get it absolutely uh, precisely, well, as much as archaeology can be precise, that's the plan again with the location mark. Why this thing even exists, it's inherited from the architectural structure of pyramids from the Old Kingdom, where sometimes this was the location covering the actual or assumed entrance to the pyramid complex. In many cases, it became a symbolical north entrance that was not in fact physically there, but the king was then supposed to be able to leave via the North Chapel and join the stars. So we're looking at a very specific place, and unlike the South Temple full of reliefs and columns, the North Chapel is actually a small place. It's just a one-room uh, chapel. And it looks schematically as something like that. On one side, you would have the entrance, and on the opposite end of the space, 
you would have something called a false door, essentially conventional Egypt Egyptological terminology, a focal point of a chapel, a place where you're offering to a deceased person a false door between this world and the next, if you like, even though it's a bit of a simplified explanation, it helps. So a false door is literally a stone door leading nowhere physically, but symbolically to the next life. The false door was obviously on the wall against the pyramid, so you could think about the king residing behind it. And on both sides of this space, from the entrance to the false door, there were offering scenes. So essentially people preparing, producing and bringing gifts, mainly food, to the deceased king, to Saint Mosheret the third. And this decorative scheme looks a little bit like that. The details, this also shows you the, the broken pieces that had to be put together to get a sense of how this really decoration of that wall looked like. So again, think in terms of this is a highly imaginative and to a certain extent, we have to admit this speculative process of rebuilding, reimagining the spaces of the shrines surrounding the pyramid. So you get the king expecting his offerings and the little figures coming to him are both human and also divine, the so-called fertility or fecundity figures, uh, fecundity figures being connected to the river Nile as symbolic representatives of the Egyptian landscape and its fertility in a shortcut explanation. Uh, John Baines who wrote on fecundity figures would probably shoot me on site for this, but um, follow up on this, uh, to take it as an oversimplification for something interesting to investigate. Uh, the um, scheme that thus presents both human offering bringers and divine offering bringers, both supporting the kingship of St. Mosset III. So this is a crucial, it's a pivotal scene for the eternal life of St. Mosset III. He's supported both by the human world and by the divine world in his quest for, uh, for the afterlife. And in here, within that scene, we get also a bit of a grid-like representation of a list of offerings. So not only we have figures bringing stuff, bringing food, but we also have a list with numbers and small figurines, again, of offering bearers holding vessels full of food. And the food goes roughly in the order of bread, onions, a lot of meat, wine, drinks, and then other things, cakes. I think cakes are on the end. So we get almost like a multiplication of the supply chain for St. Wasted III in this chapel. And now, again, uh, there is this little figure of the offering bearer highlighted, holding a vessel. And above his vessel, you can see traces of red. And these traces of red are not Middle Kingdom. They are New Kingdom. That's where they are. That's how high on the wall this was. So these little offering bearers marked with graffiti from the New Kingdom are 2.5, give or take, meters above the ground. It took some effort to get to the precise spot and to enter this little label next to the figure of the offering bearer. Maybe there was a debris on the floor. Maybe there was enough sand in the room. But on the other hand, the wall would have been probably still standing. It's really precisely embedded in that little grid-like uh, system of the offering list quite close to the figure of the king. And now probably you would like to know what do they say? There are four little labeled figures of offering bearers for St. Mosset III. And they are all, except for the one whose title and name we can't properly read, they are all scribes. There is uh, a certain gentleman called Baki, the first one, then there is an unknown, then there is Jehuti, and then there is again an unknown scribe. So they're both manifesting the literate status. They're both keen to be seen as offering bearers of St. Mosfet, the uh, third. So to give you a quick 
glance on the transliteration. Transliteration doesn't show um, <coughs> and the translation. So we get a sense of these people really aiming at some kind of new kingdom participation in the Middle Kingdom royal cult. They're showing visually what other scribes are saying in words. So a typical visitor's inscription would say, I am giving the offerings to King so-and-so. These guys went further. They said, well, we are the offering bearers of the king. And why do they care to be these specific offering bearers? They are bringing uh, interesting things. They are bringing edible offal, doesn't sound so interesting, and meat. And maybe not from our perspective, but from the ancient Egyptian perspective, all of this is important. And I'm borrowing a quote from Salima Ikram. There is a sociology of meat. Uh, meat figures um, uh, regularly on offering lists. Meat is just always there in brief, in a symbolic way, and also in detail. Detailed lists of breast meat and this meat and that meat and edible offal. And also meat figures in the preserved physical offerings as cooked or mummified food. Tutankhamun also had roasted beets. And of course, not to forget, as another Middle Kingdom example tells you, the Montuoser stila from the mat, it really is shown quite graphically in the offering lists. There is a whole uh, beef uh, leg shown in Montuverser, Montuverser's pile of uh, offerings. So we get a, a sense that this community of scribes wanted to present themselves as individuals, as individual scribes, bringing prestigious, luxurious offerings. They wanted to be seen as a group, as a community. They wanted to give their individual input. Everybody labeled their own little offering bearer. And the text and imagery together played out, performed this offering scene, the New Kingdom scribes appropriating the royal cult and embodying the uh, performance of the whole offering scene again and again and again made there for eternity in graffiti. Baki is a name that is not limited to the um, Dashur example. This example, uh, which I'm let you some time for reading, comes from Saqqara, from the step pyramid complex. And of course, we have no way of proving whether the Baki in Saqqara is also the Baki in uh, Yashur. They could all be, both be, from the uh, reign of Tutmosis III, the high reign of the year 36, combined with the 18th dynasty paleography, paleography we can't verify anymore, um, would point out to both Yashur and uh, Saqqara being graffitied in the same time. And definitely this Baki, who also refers to his geographical origin in the southern city, or Thebes, and uh, he is then referring to the local kings. And interestingly, in Saqqara, he's not referring very, very specifically to Joser. He's referring to all the kings of the Memphite node. So all the kings that had pyramids in Memphis. So he's not referring just to a particular historical personality and his cultic performance. He's referring to the whole landscape, in a way, the, whole, the kings inhabiting this. Uh, particular uh, setting. So whether there was one Baki who marked two pyramid complexes or whether there were two Bakis who did the same, in one instance the text creates the scene for us. In the other instance in Dashur it's the existing primary decoration that's drawn into this performance of the royal cult, performance done by people who would normally not participate in a royal veneration in their own time. People who were not high enough, probably not high enough, in the social uh, hierarchy. But that's not yet the end of the story where scribes and pyramid complexes are concerned. So we see them involved in a historical and also religious engagement with the site. But they're also leaving other traces. 
And towards the end of this presentation, I'd like to draw your attention to just a couple of examples that shows the diver that show the diversity of use and appropriation of a pyramid complex of any major building in Egypt. This is a quote from is an incipit from a text called the sum sum of knowledge uh, in Egyptian Kemet. It's probably from a pyramid casing fragment, again from the North Chapel area, however, and it's just showing something that roughly uh, runs like the, uh, the servant of his uh, lord, beloved by his lord. So it's just a traditional formulaic opening of probably a letter. This specific text wouldn't be a standard training for every scribe. It would be probably for specialists, for people involved in production of funerary texts. So it brings up a lot of questions. Why uh, somebody who would train on Kemet, why would they visit the pyramid complex? Because they were involved in the production of funerary, uh, funerary art in their own time. And well, they went to see how the Middle Kingdom did it and then left a scribbled example of their own training text on site. It is one possibility, but it's not the only possibility that we have. And moving forward, another New Kingdom example, which is a deity, probably Remicide Rem Protome, and a text that refers to healing. And the following is an incredibly provisional uh, trans which I currently don't agree with anymore, but it gives you an idea. What I stand by is the beginning. It's the healing element that is certainly expressed there. So it was also a veneration place that referred to a Rem deity, possibly Amun. And that may bring us to the Ramesside period, to the demolition time of the pyramid. So not only Ramesside dockets marking the place as being dismantled and recycled elsewhere, but people who worked on site, literate people who worked on site, maybe organized the demolition process, were also involved in their own devotional interest. They were still considering this is a meaningful place. This is a place where it matters to scribble and to venerate uh, deities. So you get uh, a sense of a diversity. So from all these fragments that we have, we are trying to rebuild something that's not just the pyramid and its shrines, even though these are vital for our understanding of the Middle Kingdom architecture, but also the Middle Kingdom kingship, the ideology, the politics behind the Middle Kingdom kingship. But we're also looking at the reception history of the site in antiquity, reception history that has both an ideological and intellectual element and then the material element of uh, reusing it uh, very, very uh, sort of physically. Uh, to give you a sense of a wrap up at the end, the timeline seems to be for different for the, the 18th and the Ramesside times for 19th dynasty. In the 18th dynasty, we get this sense of an admiration, the historical knowledge, also the historicity of the contemporary sovereign and the sort of articulation of political concern, and definitely a devotional element. Indeed, an appropriation of an ancient royal cult by the New Kingdom people who might have been on an assignment in the area, who might have been there indeed to inspect or even to study the pyramid complex. In the Ramesside times, none of this is explicitly ruled out, but we don't seem to have all that many visitors texts, but we definitely do get the demolition texts in addition to uh, everything else. So as a result, we are not only looking at epigraphy, because you may ask what was the point of drilling down to one broken text on a broken wall? Well, hopefully I've convinced, I don't know if I've convinced, but maybe at least I've illustrated that this level of granularity of understanding of secondary epigraphy does allow for something like uh, our thinking about a life of a building and by looking into a cultural biography of something as major for the ancient Egyptians as a pyramid complex from the building process to its demolition survival and ultimately its final 
uh, or for the time being, the latest mutation into a heritage site, we are looking at a monument as it was received and appropriated by different communities across a very, very long period uh, of time. So we are led to question the regimes of historicity, the understanding and the use of the past in different chapters of Egyptian history and indeed also history beyond Egypt, because the point nine on the life of the pyramid, the heritage side, marks a major change in thinking about historicity, a change tied very much to the 19th and 20th century. And uh, that, I think, however, should be uh, a topic for a different talk. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. Thanks for thanking me. I thought we were doing it. The, uh, that was great. Uh, right. Thank you very much. That was, that was tremendous. Um, Sen was Reverend, uh, Sen was Reverend Third. Um, I mean, I don't know whether anyone here has read. Um, I mean, my, one of, when I was first learning about Egypt uh, many decades ago, uh, one of the books I read, which I very much enjoyed, I still do enjoy it actually, is uh, Volume Two of Martin Bernal's Black Athena. Um, really a great book, and um, in many ways also totally wrong. <laughs> but he um, he he argues uh, that um, uh, the pharaoh sent was read the third uh, lies behind the uh, figure of Solosius, and he accepts at face value um, Herodotus's evidence, which probably is based on some Egyptian sources from much later, that um, Solosius sent was read the third conquered most of the um, most of the Mediterranean and uh, including um, uh, Anatolia and uh, was in contact with the Greeks. But it's, it's very interesting to hear about uh, his, he's a hope it was Samuel Thurman, so it wasn't Samuel Thurman, it should have been third. It was the third, I think, yes. Major building. So that was absolutely great. I'm wondering whether the Greeks would have uh, come to, if he's right, maybe Greeks would have come to, uh, would have come to, if somebody's been known as a and, uh, Mycenaean, Aegean. Visiting represented in tombs, and I've actually come and paid. We don't have any you know, you know, you're being graffiti. Not yet, but I, I've tried to look for any Minoan pottery on site. But the yeah. pottery is a problem, it doesn't mean they were there. The, the, the question I, I mean, just at the end, I was thinking of various other questions, but at the end, I was just thinking, you know, how did the so much of Egyptian ideology clearly is surely is devoted to preserving the memory of particularly of. Pharaohs, but generally the elite, the idea that you survive in the afterlife. So, how did they deal with the idea of demolishing a great building like that? So, you know, did they ever talk about that, or is it just sort of pushed under the carpet? They do talk about that. They engaged with the problem specifically in the Ramesside period, which I think is not by coincidence. I mean, the thought was floating around since people started building pyramids. There was always a kind of an intellectual undercurrent discussing what does really make you immortal? <laughs> so people did ask that, does it even matter to try to have a monument or just use the life that you have on this earth? There was the kind of a yeah. debate about forms of memory. The other element was that actually memory should consist of, of people remembering your good name. So whatever you build doesn't really matter all that much, as long as people can remember your deeds, but preferably then, if you can put the description of your life on a statue, a stela, or in a tomb, then yeah. you get a better chance of yes. being remembered, yes. because you get represented all over the place That's and right. your inscription. Excellent. And finally, <laughs> the Ramesside bit, immortality of the writer, Chester B.T. Four, the papyrus in the British yeah. Museum, that's uh, drastic, because it says, their shrines are destroyed, their tombs are covered in mud, everything is gone, they have no surviving family, but people who write, they are immortal. Yes. That's the, the gist of it. So there was a kind of a discussion running, to a certain extent, we, we would have to imagine, uh, among the Egyptian intellectuals, what does constitute immortality? Yeah. Someone, someone suggested once that uh... Uh, just to bring this back to classics, one of um, Hor Horace's great 
owed owes one Sosius et Exequi Monumentum Ire Perennius. I, I know that referring to his poetry, I have built a monument more lasting than bronze. It's actually based on the Egyptian, on the Egyptian text and shows shows influence, but I imagine it's a sentiment which you could uh, you could independently come up with in different in different times. 